So we've got ourselves zoomed, and we've got the, the folders here. So to demystify a visible thread, what is a folder doing? Well, it's a very simple animal. It's simply there to house a number of docs. Here's my docs. I've got an RFP, uploaded twice. I've got a sow. I've got a response doc. And I want to do some analysis on these things. So the bits and bobs here are basically different shortcuts. And I'm not convinced that the actual zoom is right on this projector either. Can people see this at the back? Is it sharp or no? Let's try a little zoom action. Hang on. Is that a little bit better? Wow. About three hours later, we got to sort it out. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. And I'm sure the video guy is uh, thrilled with this lack of light. OK, cool. Uh, but at least you guys can see this, right? OK, so what are we seeing here? We've seen a folder containing four docs. A very simple thing about Visible Thread is that the folder, since it's selected and since it has these four docs, gives us some interesting insights. So what's here? An RFP, a sow, a doc. So I'm going to click on discovery. We talked about discovery, right? We also talked about dictionaries. But the single biggest thing about discovery, and I, maybe it's our problem, I'm not sure, but this is not based on some dictionary analysis. Discovery, what it does is it automatically sucks out of all the documents the frequently occurring nouns, or if you want to get fancy, noun phrases. So if I say, we will deliver a program management plan, program management plan is my noun phrase. You get me? So once you actually get your head around that very simple concept, discovery becomes pretty damn interesting. Because if I, for instance, want to know what the heck is this sow talking about, I select my statement of work. And guess what? These are the thematic elements of the sow. Access, data, work. When I select one of these thematic elements, for instance, IP, is that internet protocol? Is it intellectual property? Is that too light for everybody, or is that, is that good? This side of the room is kind of a little bit more dim, and this side is a little bit lighter. It's good. Who, we'll do a bit of an A-B test. Who had the better experience? Anyway, uh, so IP, guess what? It's not intellectual property. It's internet protocol. I didn't put in a dictionary to get that view. I simply uploaded a doc, and bang, I've got my view. So it's summarizing to a large extent what is going on in this document. Now, once we do that, what's kind of neat is I can jump out. Well, I got that one sow. Is my response here addressing IP? It's a valid question, right? Am I aligned? Well, let's check the question. So I select my folder. I look at my discovery on the folder level. And notice something interesting here, aside from that little hover over that I need to get rid of. Since I've selected the folder, a moment ago I was in the sow, and now I'm at the folder, each of these columns represents each doc here. Make sense? So you know we're jumping up a level. Now what's interesting about that view, if I now want to check my IP question, well, I found that the sow was demanding that we do something around IP, intellectual property, not. Intellectual protocol, yes. Why don't I just search? And I'll just do a quick search here. Haven't done a dictionary. There's no dictionary going on here. And now IP is showing as part of equipment. So IP isn't really a good search. So let's just select the thematic element here, which is IP. Now, what am I seeing here? It was addressed in the statement of work. Turns out it's in my response as well. So I'm starting to see this cross-reference. I want to get a little bit more detail on that. Perhaps what I might want to do is actually check the box to the right of the number 8, showing me all the occurrences of IP across both docs. You see that alignment thing, the balance act? This is nothing to do with new features in 3.1, by the way. This is just what's already. Those of you who have VT can do this today. Our problem is we probably don't do a good enough job helping you understand how to do it. There's a question. I might have missed it, but sure. you could have IP in an RFP that means both. Oh, yeah. Okay. So oh, yeah. does that show up when you do the search? No, and that's where the human brain is very useful <laughs> and the review capability. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get that data to you very quickly. Right. 
<laughs> so that you can make that determination. But you couldn't put all the occurrences in there. Again, I'm going to emphasize, did, did everybody hear this? This view is not me putting a damn thing in here. This view is an automatic extraction from what's in these docs. It's terribly important that that's clear. And we often get ourselves in a twist over this because we talk about dictionary, dictionary, dictionary. Oh, you got to create, spend 45 minutes doing a dictionary. These are not dictionaries. They kind of look like they are, but they're not. So if I put in anything into this solution, it could be a bankruptcy letter coming from a financial institution. This view will show the key thematic elements in that letter, the things at play in that document, and across these documents. That's by default. That's, what That's just what it does. This is the bit, the fancy bit. This is, we all talk about you know, artificial intelligence. That's what's going on here. We have trained the solution to work off technical content to identify linguistically what are the actual key topics at play. That's what's going on here. This is a combination of natural language processing and AI. Sorry, another question. Question, do you think this, uh, where the files have been created, can you do folder to folder? No. <laughs> Sorry, the question was, can you do folder to folder? And the answer was no. So put all the files. The, the other point, this is not a document management system. So there's nothing to stop you creating subfolders or adding files multiple times to multiple different locations. That's not its purpose. It's not SharePoint. Don't worry about it. Delete folders willy-nilly, whatever. Some smaller shops will actually double up and use it as a repository, but that's not its primary intent. Question? Oh, sorry, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, we were talking earlier uh, with Glenn about this exact feature, and then you also emphasize the ability to export out this data if you have to. Yeah. So the question is, can I show the ability to export out? God, this is going to become a glorified demo of 3.0. So, OK. <laughs> For those of you who want to know what's in 3.1 that is new, if I don't get to it, please corner me afterwards, but we'll definitely get to it. Um, uh, so I'm going to address this question. There's a second question back here, which I'll get to in, in a moment, if, if OK. Brilliant. Um, right, so the question was, what can we do with this data? And now this is the kind of one, two step around, how could you quickly arrive at a dictionary? Because let's say, and I had the conversation with uh, somebody from TAPE, uh, this gentleman here. The point is, he gets a PWS. He wants to know, well, how can I very quickly arrive at that dictionary? Well, the answer is the one-two punch. Look at the PWS. Let's assume the statement of work was the PWS. Excuse me, I should click the right thing here. So here's my statement of work. Here's my discovery. I can export this entire list. Or if I want to export just the themes on the right, I can do that here. Let's just in export the entire list. I just want that data. And I want to pull it into Excel so that I can slice out the things that I don't really care about because we're going to pick up everything. If it says contractor shall, the word contractor will be in there frequently. But that's of little rev relevance for us. So what do I have? I've got a spreadsheet that you probably can't see, so let me zoom it. Right? We've got contractor, contractor personnel, there's something interesting, or 0071, no idea what that is, but there you go. Individual contract personnel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a rather large list, but if I take a few minutes and actually use my intelligence to say, actually, you know what, a lot of this is junk, but there's a good bit of interesting stuff here, and maybe sort it by priority <coughs> or frequency over here, that helps us get so you all know how to use Excel sort, right? It's not a hard thing to do. I just am under pressure right now, so I'm not going to do it. But <laughs> <laughs> correct. <laughs> OK, I'm going to do it. <laughs> right, here we go. Uh, I'll tell you, I think it's under, I always get confused. OK, here we go. Frequency, expand the selection, sure. Column C, frequency, largest to smallest. Right, how about that? Thank you. OK. So now we have DHS, we have days. Couldn't care less about days. This is an interesting starting point now to begin the process of creating that dictionary for that particular strategic proposal that you really want to win, because you're going to invest a lot of money in actually the bid process and the actual chase process. So why would that be interesting? Because I could take that little list, and for the sake of argument, geez, I'm going into a demo land that I don't normally do here, so let me just actually do it. Uh, if I can, I might delete all this crap 
And I might say, right, that's a fine list. Must take that in. There's a bit of Ajax action, which I presume Ajax is actually a brand of cleaning product uh, over my neck of the woods. But Ajax in this context, I'm assuming, is to do with IT. And they're looking for a little ajax -y action on the IT infrastructure here. So what would I do? I would come back here. I would switch my perspective away from these folders. And I would go into this little area called dictionaries. Again, anybody on an older version of ETDocs, you need to upgrade. That's there. And I go to my dictionaries area. And I say, great, I would like to create a brand spanking new dictionary. And I'm going to call it a quality dictionary. It's a YYY quality dictionary. And I would go ahead and I would say, import from comma separated format. And I would suck that thing in. And two minutes later, I've got my dictionary. Not 45 minutes, two minutes. Now, interesting discussion. The prior discussion was very interesting when Gene Boeing was talking. And, and there was various comments about how, you know, the question of how to get that dictionary, how many people should be involved. It's a people question. Good dictionaries are not tech. So the question, the, the person who asked the question, I think it was yourself, it's not the speed of pressing the buttons to get the dictionary in there. It's garbage in, garbage out. So what you have to do, and this is what I thoroughly recommend you do, is go allocate some time, get a few cups of coffee, something stronger if you need it, get into a room, and just whitelist stuff, whiteboard it, stick it on a list. Exchange some emails. Ask people to collect lists of terms that they think could be important. Corral it all together, put it in a spreadsheet, suck it in, and that's your number one dictionary. It's not hard to do, but it requires brain power, and you have to think about it. So creating dictionaries, often the pathway to get there is through discovery, but often it's just, yeah, actually, I know what's important here. We know our win themes. We know our differentiation points. We need to actually build our dictionary for that. Or legal come in and say, you should never use the word expert because expert is going to kill us and we're going to be on the hook for proving our expertise without sufficient validation, whatever, that list. Legal will always have a laundry list of crap that they will hit you with as it gets to late stage in the process. So dictionaries, 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 but it's really important to understand it's not intimidating stuff. I'm going to ask Denai Lalianga to stand up, Denai. Yes. Denai is our customer success, VP of Prof Services and Customer Success. If you have any concerns about how to create dictionaries, Denai is your person. We've got videos of GoGo -Go online. Denai can help you. It's really simple stuff. But the biggest time you're going to spend is actually thinking, what is a good dictionary in this context? What's it supposed to do? My experience, dictionaries fall into two camps. One is repeated dictionaries that you always, always, always use across your proposals. The second is specific dictionaries because that's a strategic effort. It's a strategic uh, prop that we must win or that we really want to be winning. OK, that's that. I said I'd give you a quick five minute on this. This is not five minutes. Is this useful? Yes. Will I keep going? Yes. Fair enough, OK. Right. I'm just going to pick a few bits and bobs. Again, I'm going to emphasize the fact that this is not a process tool. It's not there. You know, Shipley has a fantastic process. Uh, you can tailor it. You can make low Shipley or high Shipley or low felt or whatever, any of these other things. You know, Process-wise, you all have your color team approach to these process questions. This tool is all about injecting at certain moments in time. You map your process to bits and pieces of this. And you say, OK, at Red Team, we need to do a readability check. Let's do a readability check. Or when we get a revision of a contract, and my question to you is, how many people are sitting in the scenario where you will get a first draft of a proposal, an RFP from the government? You work against that. You develop your win themes. You develop all your stuff against that. And then you get a second draft. Is that common, Hans? Okay. So how do you, now I'm going to do a little. Lisa, actually, I'm going to ask you to help me. How do you actually work with that? What's I've got a mic here somewhere, I think. Here we go. Who wants to? Oh, so, so, sorry. So VT users will do what? Thank you. Non-VT users will do what? In how, let me, let me rephrase that. How do you do your compare if you don't have VT? Can I have a show of hands? How many people are using word compare on a daily basis or on a, on a frequent basis? Show of hands. OK. Forgive me, I'm about to do a pitch for a visible thread compare. <laughs> but 
But since, and, and, and for the people who showed their hands who are doing word compare, are you Visible Thread users or owners of Visible Thread? Yes. Who said yes? <laughs> <sighs> okay. <laughs> Your call. Right. For the Visible Thread users who use the Visible Thread compare and used to use the word compare, any brave volunteers can tell me why you're now using Visible Thread compare. At the break. Yeah. Speed. It finds everything. OK. Finds everything, accuracy, speed. Gene? It's because you get one, one Excel worksheet with both of them on the sides. The old one on the left, the new one on the right, and you can see line by line by line. And it will tell you whether it's the same identical, whether it's been deleted, whether it's been added, and whether it's by change. And you have it line by line by line in both documents. OK. Elizabeth? OK, this is an important one, actually. So can you just repeat that, Elizabeth? Now you can compare Excel sheets. And why is that important for you? Because so much of our work is done in Excel, and we need to compare. Well, the price is actually. So and I can see why you got your promotion now. <laughs> oh, no, joking. So you got you sorted. OK, excellent. OK. So I'm going to make the quick plug for Visible Thread University. Honestly, it's not a university because we want to make you feel daunted by it. But it really is a really handy dandy online resource that you can self-pace your training and go through this stuff. So it's interesting. So for, for those who are wondering, well, what the hell is he talking about? Now he's on about compare. And why, why are people saying that this is a useful thing? I'll just show you how it works. So I'm going to show you two different versions of a doc. Now, I really do need to get some, some element of what's new in this thing, so I'll, I'll try my best. Um, but let me just try to show you this one. It was interesting that Oasis was mentioned earlier, because I used to have a demo Oasis one as well, but I don't at this point. This uh, is a, I think it's Health and Human Services, uh, fairly large RFP. Anybody recognize this one, HCATS? Yeah. Anyway, yeah? OK, it is Health and Human Services, right? OK, it's right. It's a draft RFP. Uh, let's have a quick mosey, and we'll see how big is this document. I'm just opening it up. I'll show you what it looks like. Um, draft request for proposal, a mere 144 pages. Um, and it's in PDF, you'll see. Pretty standard doc, right? Um, whoops. Scrolling down, it's, I like to make this crack all the time, it's literally got draft written all over it. <laughs> Haha. Okay, um, so the question now is, and, and you'll see, you know, X, Y, there's all kinds of stuff here that's kind of, you know, pretty drafty in nature. So we're working off this thing, the final drop comes in, or the next rev comes in, we spent a lot of energy, a lot of time on this, it's fairly strategic. How would you, if you have, Microsoft Word, and you try opening this up, you will crash Microsoft Word. Just So if you're trying to do it in the standard compare, use Adobe Pro for this one. I'm not even sure if that will survive 150 pages of, of analysis, but there you go. One of the comments was made, which was speed, and I think completeness and accuracy, and this idea that Gene talked about in terms of the Excel spreadsheet. Let me show you the result rather than talking about it. So. Big nasty button here called Compare Docs. Again, for those of you who are on old versions of VT, please upgrade. You'll see big nasty buttons here that are pretty damn obvious. You don't need to go off on a day training course to figure out that Compare Docs, the big mega button here, compares docs. It's all good. We hit our RFP. I select my draft. That first one, I select my final. That means that my baseline is going to be the draft. I want to compare against that. I click Compare. 150 pages going through the hopper versus 160 or so against the final one, because the final one was substantially more, or a little bit more. And it's off doing stuff, and with any joy, it'll actually finish. And here's my finish. And when I look at my finish result, very important thing is that it's not a visualization view. It's an Excel spreadsheet, fundamentally a reportable format. 
fundamentally something I can work with to add my own commentary to do whatever the heck I want in Excel to that. So what's interesting about this is that there's a left side and there's a right side. Can you zoom in? I can, certainly can. Is everybody having difficulty seeing this? Yeah. Fair enough. That's because I'm on 80% zoom. Can you see that now? Maybe. Rough conceptual seeing, right? You don't have to read it. Okay, so lots of red stuff here. And if I scroll down, all that red stuff, by the way, is because the final version had a table of contents and there's a complete, there's no table of contents on the left, therefore there's a lot of gaps, right? That's what that red means. Now what's interesting here is that we go straight into this modification thing. This is a draft station. This is not a draft station. That's, I don't care about that. That's not material. Why would I care about that? It's a text compare, so I'm going to float down. HR, same argument, human resources, who cares, government, lowercase, uppercase, whatever. So I'm scrolling down by page, and now I see a quite a bit of red. So now I'm beginning to say, shit, you know, there's something here. I need to pause. And what is the something here? In the old version, it said learning management systems, while a subset of training and HC management will not be addressed. In other words, it's out of scope, and it's gone. What does that mean? <laughs> our pricing guys are affected. Our legal guys are affected. Our tech guys are affected. Everything is affected. The scope has changed. And we can easily spot this. The rest of this stuff, TMA, TMAP, who okay, cares? The rest of this is, is, don't care. So it's Excel. So what am I going to do? Well, given that it's Excel, I'm going to enable editing. Because everything you download in any form is always going to have that little button there. That's Microsoft Genius. I'll scroll down there. So first point is hit that enable edit thing first. It's a bit of a pain in the neck you get to the point, right? What do I do? Well, I'm lazy. I'm just going to whack a little yellow on that. And I'm going to fly through this. And probably in the space of about 25 minutes, I'll have the entire 150 pages reviewed. So what have I got? I'm under pressure. I've got two versions. Try battling Word or try battling PDF, Adobe Pro. Fine, you can do it. You'll take out your pen and paper, and you'll do an attempt at a report. It won't be that complete. You may miss stuff. And the biggest single issue with the compare in Word and Adobe, and they all follow the same path, is that they are designing this stuff to merge two files. That's what it's about. You got your left, you got your right, and you got your merge. But that's not what you guys need. You want your differences in a format that you need to take forward. Because this is a glorified compliance matrix, really, if you think about it. Are we compliant with the changes that these guys wanted? So you build your compliance matrix. Now you've got your delta between the original and the final. Now you can add more stuff to your compliance matrix. Not by magic, not in VT, just by hand. But you've shortcutted a whole bunch of risky items. And the other thing that Elizabeth uh, from, from GD uh, mentioned is that it's also Excel spreadsheets we want to compare. So what would we do in a pricing scenario? Let me just find a couple of things here. So here's a few Excel spreadsheets. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run the Excel compare against this. I often find that people, particularly on the pro proposal side, say, well, that's a pricing issue. Uh, don't worry about that. That's somebody else's job, <laughs> which, is, which is kind of um, a real team attitude, right? <laughs> That's great. So uh, if you happen to be buddy-buddy with your pricing colleagues, and you happen to have visible thread on your desktop, maybe kindly offer them a quick usage of it so that they can save all this time for comparing Excel spreadsheets. Because even worse than docs and PDFs, yeah, there's some option in, in Flippin' Word and, and, and Adobe Pro to do compares. And you're all doing it, unless you're doing it in VT, which is far better, of course, as we now know. There's nothing in Excel. Who, I mean, when you were dealing with this in Excel, did you go off and start to get some IT support and code up some macros to figure out the differences? Or who's, I mean, how do you compare Excel? Pardon me? Pray a lot. Pray a lot, yeah. Well, the good Lord is uh, going to help us out on that one. I don't, I don't know if that's going to help us in any real way. So let me show you. In fact, what I normally do is I normally show you the spreadsheet so that you can understand what's going on here. So I'm going to show you the Excel spreadsheet. And spreadsheets are an interesting thing. They have what Microsoft has for years called workbooks. Well, an Excel spreadsheet is really a workbook comprising different sheets. So actually, you're not just comparing one sheet with another sheet. You're comparing multiple sheets in a 
potentially nasty workbook. In this example, we've got a summary. Again, you don't have to worry about the ins and outs of all this stuff. It's, it's real. I should actually zoom that. Summary, assumptions, CLINs, service order, labor rates, labor market, the, you know, it, it goes on and on and on. And then the question is, what has changed between this and the newer version that I just got in? And if you think about Excel comparisons, how do you know that your version one of your own compliance matrix, which is running around in Excel, how do you know the changes that happen between that and version two? How can you streamline the collaboration around Excel spreadsheets? The answer is you can't, really, unless you start to use a little comparison action, as I'm going to show you. So in other words, this is not just the inbound direction. I've got something from the government. It's an Excel spreadsheet. I want to see the differences. It's your stuff. If you're using Excel, as most of you do, as a, effectively a lightweight project management tool, that's what it is. You know, that's what a compliance matrix is. It, it's, it's a project management asset. That's fundamentally what it is. You can now start to compare version 1 versus version 2 of the compliance matrix itself. The stuff that you've written, you could compare anything. As I like to tell people, I compare my own management accounts coming from our finance team from version A to B to C because there are always changes. And it's a nightmare document. I mean, it's a nightmare spreadsheet with in excess of 20 different sheets. And there's numbers here. And those numbers are kind of important because they run our business. So I will use it for my own purposes for exactly that reason. So let's just quack a little Excel here. OK, uh, which one will we do? We'll do the amend versus the final. We'll whack that out. By the way, your option to actually do Excel compare, if you get some enthusiastic uh, IT person, they'll say, yeah, I can code that for you. No problem. I'll do, I'll do it. And you'll come back, and you'll get some brittle stuff that might do some flagging <laughs> directly in the sheet, if you're lucky. But it rarely works. And try Googling how to compare Excel spreadsheets, and you'll get Microsoft saying, yeah, just do a diff. Just compare them. So you know that thing where you can open two spreadsheets? And you scroll, and it attempts to be synchronous? <laughs> I mean, it's nonsense. So let's open up our report. The benefit of the Word doc comparison, one of the major benefits is that you get a reportable format in Excel, showing you the left, right. It's exactly the same here. I've got an Excel spreadsheet. It's a bit kind of recursive, right? This is actually our report. And I'll just kind of move it up a little bit so you can see it. And I'll zoom in a little bit so you can also see it. Turn on my enable editing, of course. Always a good point. Zoom in. So what is this view showing us? It's comparing every sheet in the original workbooks. It's telling me immediately that my cover sheet is identical, but it's saying that there are two rows different in sheet two. And you can see also each sheet is itself compared. So we've got this overall summary, which gives me a very clear understanding. Yeah, identical, identical. Woo, 10 rows different here. What's that about? Let's just go and have a look-see. So what is this showing us? The issue with Excel is actually it deals with cells. I know it sounds a funny statement, right? But it is an issue because if you were to imagine how you might do a compare, you might say, well, Jesus, you know, I need to decompose all the cells. I need this massive. You know, imagine if you actually took all those cell contents and put them in one big massive list. That would be a huge thing. And we as human beings wouldn't be very good at actually comparing that because it would just volume or data overload. So we did a lot of work around this. And some of you who are sitting in this room, or perhaps not sitting in this room, were very helpful for us because we actually ran it by you before we actually baked this fully. Our design was, was important to get right. So let me explain this view. We're now down to the sheet where we know there's 10 rows different. So the first thing is that we're orienting you around rows. Because if you think from a cognitive standpoint, you speak, you, you almost map Excel in rows. You say it's on row 10, or it's on row 50. You never really say it's on column E. Maybe you do, but the primary orientation is the row, right? That's your navigation. So in one weird way, that row is almost equivalent to in a document. It's like a page. So it gives you this kind of pointer into where things are at. So we wanted to take advantage of that fact that we kind of think as human beings around rows as a priority, not a exclusively instead of, but it's rows first, then cells, and, and kind of columns second. So our first seven rows are identical. How do we cater for cell values? The commas separate the cell values. 
So once you understand that simple way of representing what's in a spreadsheet, you begin to get the full understanding of what's changed in a very quick way. Because it's all about speed of cognition. That's what this is about. So I can tell you immediately, row eight, service order fee element, the first cell has changed to markup rights here, the first cell in the final version. All fairly innocuous stuff here. Row 16, element one, two, and three has been added into the actual title there. Sorry, it was in the title, it's gone now. 0%, 0%, no, no change. Row 18 has got a little sneaky note on there. And the note here, which is now gone from the final, says total service order fee is the only allowable markup on service orders with the exception of the emergency SO fee where applicable. Your pricing colleagues will be quite interested in that row and that change because it will have an impact on how you're going to do your pricing. So the point about this is that some of this stuff is important and some of it is not. Same approach. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Flag the things that are important, flick it over to your colleagues in pricing, or indeed, if you're kind enough to give them a the usage of your license, have them just do it directly. But the speed is really important here, and the ease of use is really important. I hope that makes sense. And for those of you who are doing Excel stuff, this is a godsend. It's, it's a real big deal. OK, um, <laughs> I'm almost. Yeah, if we spend all our time doing demo stuff, I'll never get to the interesting points um, of the new stuff. Look, we can do acronym pulls. We can uh, look at the dictionary stuff. I, we can shred docs. We can do readability analysis. I don't want to bore, so roughly speaking, show of hands, how many people are current visible thread users, docs? So I, I want to respect you guys and not go through all those. So for those who have not seen Visible Thread and you're here maybe checking us out thinking, could this be useful in your organization? I would urge you, talk to some of our sales guys who are floating around, or they'll grab you for sure. We've got Patrick Ryan here. Patrick, uh, if you stand up. Um, Craig Melton is here. Roland Bradley is here. I told you we, we doubled our team size, so we've got a whole bunch of salesy guys around. Uh, I promise they won't kill you with kind of overselling, but please set up a demo where we can actually show you some of this stuff because it'll take a little bit longer than what I have at my disposal. A lot of great stuff in the tool. So now I'm going to go back to what I wanted to talk about for those of you who are currently on version 3.0. What changes have we added in in version 3.1? Admin privileges, Red Hat. I'll go through this very quickly. So in the old version of Visible Thread, in order to edit the famous dictionary or to change settings, you had to have admin privileges. So there was only one option here, admin. Am I an admin or not? And that also doubled up to allow people to add and remove users and activate and deactivate users. So it did too much. So you had to check the admin privilege in order to allow people to edit dictionaries. But most people should be, by default, in my opinion, but it's your policy, should be able to edit dictionaries. Okay. So that was important. So we realized this, and actually this time last year at the panel discussion, as I mentioned earlier, we had several people say, in fact, when you hear more than two people asking for a particular feature, you kind of know you need to pay a bit of attention to that. Uh, and I know the folks, actually, it was Jessica's colleague from Rocco Collins, uh, Pan Henkel, I think, last year, who was actually mentioning this, and uh, some of the guys from GDIT and Boeing and, and various other people. Okay. So here's what it now looks like. And I realize it's maybe kind of hard to see, but in effect, the basic takeaway is we split it out. It now says, can administer users, can edit settings. These are the thresholds for clear language. Uh, these are, there's new capability in here, which allows you set what you mean by a long sentence, a very long sentence. And can edit dictionaries is just here. So that split out is important for existing users. Uh, if you're looking at Visible Thread for the first time, you couldn't care less about this stuff. But later on, as you start to use it, it becomes important. Okay, So that's important. We split that out, and that's new in this release. I'm not going to demo this live because it's a bit tedious and not that interesting. But basically, well, or will I? Does anybody want to see it live? No. It's not interesting. All right. Okay, cool. Uh, Red Hat support. I'm certainly not going to demo this live. I'm no way to demo this. But it's important uh, because a lot of corporates, a lot of IT tech heads, they, they, love, they love the old red hat, and it's, it's, it's great. It's fairly standard. Uh, info security, our great friends in info security, always get a little bit hot under the collar when they uh, hear things. Um, many shops will, will work perfectly well with virtual appliances, for, for, which is our preferred distribution mechanism, which means that everything is kind of self-contained. Everything works out of the box. It's an hour, two hours, and you're set up, and you're running with visible thread docs. But 
Some large organizations really want to kind of unpack it all and get it all into their own little environment. So when we say Red Hat Linux, what we effectively have done is we've unpacked all of the components, and there's quite a few, and allowed them to be configured separately running on a Red Hat operating system. That's what basically that means. A lot of testing involved in that. It's not glamour stuff. But the benefit is that IT no longer veto it. Because sometimes you can be absolutely convinced of the value of Invisible Thread Docs, and then you'll have an IT guy saying, well, that's not our corporate standard. We can't do that, and blah, 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 blah. So Red Hat is important in that context. Full details on our support center, how to deploy Visible Thread Docs on Red Hat. And just for any of you to remind you, support.visiblethread.com is our support site. Uh, it's accessible off our course site, so you can always find it on the support menu. And then I will re-emphasize, if you've got questions about usage or about any of these items that I'm covering, send a mail to support at visiblethread.com. We will create a trouble ticket, and it will be tracked, and you'll get a response at some point. Generally, pretty fast. OK. Has anyone not had good response rates from our support team? Anyone had good response rates from our support team? <laughs> and most of you are doing nothing. OK, fair enough. I saw a little raise of a hand there. People are afraid to raise their hands. Cool. OK, readability enhancements. I like this stuff because we've taken, we talked about, or I talked about earlier, this idea of a lightweight solution. In fact, I'm going to go back to demo for a quick second. Oops. Um, so again, particularly for those who have not seen Visible Thread before, readability, when it shows Invisible Thread, sorry, I'm trying to find this thing. There's a doc, it's a proposal. There's readability. It'll come up. And what we'll see here is the report, which will show things like long sentences, passive voice density, that grade level stuff, um, and a bunch of other things. So top level stats here. These are kind of the, the traffic light type stats. Long sentence 9.52. It, it sounds like in Jessica's world, that would actually be pretty good. So she'd probably have it configured to show as green, whereas in my world, it's uh, not great. Uh, red here, passive voice. So clearly, I'm a very strict disciplinarian on writing on this one. Or perhaps my content is of a type that doesn't, uh, you know, it's going to somebody in the outer world. It's not going to a, a tech person or somebody who has a tolerance for this stuff. So my thresholds are different from hers. But here is the various visual cues. So when I talk about VT readability, we took this chunk, sucked it out of the product, and crafted this new lightweight product called Visible Thread Readability, which is really brilliant for those stakeholders in your organization who can't afford the luxury of buying into a VT docs, nor do they need all of this compare Excel mumbo jumbo and all this acronym pull stuff. They don't. I didn't demo acronym polls, by the way, but anybody who's doing acronym checking, you'll get a kick out of this stuff as well. So we pulled it out, and we put it into its own tool. And I was hoping to demo that tool. Maybe I'll get to it in the afternoon session. Maybe I won't. But I'll show you what that looks like. But it's a very nice, neat, lightweight tool for actually doing this. Why did I want to show you all this stuff? It's because over here, if I can get back to my slide, I'm talking about readability enhancements. So what we've done is we've actually taken in, before we used to have just long sentences. You know, anything above 20 words was a long sentence. What we realized, and we realized that in the visible thread readability scenario, is that you need to get a little bit more fine grain. So we've introduced the idea of very long sentences. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of research went into that. But in seriousness, the idea of actually calibrating very long Uber flip and run on sentences versus standard long sentences, it's got some impact. So certainly, if you're looking for kind of lowest hanging fruit, go after your extremely long sentences, then sort out your long sentences. It just gives it a bit more nuance to the overall equation. This is a flashy new screen. Uh, I would hate to show you the old one. Actually, for the fun of it, I will show you the old one. <laughs> Why not? since we're, we're in around the neck of the woods. So what did the old one look like? Oh, Flip, I can't show it to you because this is the new one. Never mind. OK, the old one was horrible, right? Horrible. <laughs> um, this one is much better, but actually there's a serious element to this. And I should get into presentation mode, so bear with me on this. 
So aside from the kind of flashy bar things, I mean, all of that was actually in the old stuff. But what's interesting here, and I got asked a lot over the years, and we finally were able to prioritize it. Treat sentences with 25 words or greater are as long, or 30 words as very long. And that's now configurable in your environment, which was never configurable before. And it kind of gives you more nuance, so it'll help those of you who are actually focused on that kind of gamification, that readability, cleansing idea, get more nuanced as to your environment. Because you're the best determinator as to what is really long and what's very long in your context. Um, I also want to point out, and I don't know how relevant it is in the context of most of you in this room, but as part of our kind of growth in the last uh, year, certainly, particularly with the likes of the Australian government standardizing on visible threat solutions and the Canadian government with French and English going on, multilingual analysis has become very important for us. Can I have a show of hands? Who, who is dealing with more than just the English language or in, indeed English English versus British English? So there are some hands, okay. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but readability, flesh, the algorithm behind that, and if anybody wants to kind of a, well, I, okay. It's a number between 0 and 100. This is Wikipedia. Um, and the higher you go to 100, the more readable the content is. And it's roughly based on syllable count combined with long sentences, a few other little factors in there, but that's roughly what readability is. The problem with fresh readability is that it's designed specifically for the English language. And the reason that that is the case is because counting syllables in English is kind of hard, believe it or not. We all think it's easy, but it's actually hard for machines to do that very well. Whereas non-English languages have different contexts, different understandings of what a syllable is. So LIX is a very nice new formula that we've introduced, which is ideal for non-English and English language. It's a different readability measure and a different score. So now if you upload a non-English document, a Portuguese, in fact, I saw somebody uploading Haitian Creole there not too long ago, bizarre which was new to me, not that it's a bizarre language, but it was just, who knew, Haitian Creole. And you know, when you start to see these documents uploaded, it will automatically, or we will automatically detect that, and we will automatically apply licks rather than flesh readability in the actual views. And what's really neat about that is that we map the lick setting to the grade level. So if you're now doing localization work or internationalization work, and you've got your source document, which is English, you'll see side by side the LIX rating for that English document, and you would expect the destination document, which you've translated, to be more or less similar in tone, which is a really neat little kind of segue uh, that we found. So as we're addressing more of the enterprise, the true enterprise, these factors come into play. Uh, any medium to large company has got operations in multiple jurisdictions and multiple countries throughout the planet. And you're all in, many of you are in companies that are very large, where your colleagues in Europe or your colleagues in Asia Pac are doing, you know, are basically doing what you do, except in their languages, of course. So I was going to show that live. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not, because <laughs> that was the view that you get, so you'll see that view. Um, I don't know, sorry, I missed out on that. That should not be number one, that should be number four or five or something like this. This I did want to demo, because this is really cool, in my opinion. And it's also going to appeal to those of you who are genuinely using visible thread, but you've had a frustration. The frustration has been, fine, what you generate is great. The shred is great, love it. But I just don't want that column. Or I'd like more columns put in. Or you know what, that content is lovely. I'd like to pull out all the date references. Or there's some flow down fire clauses. You know what, I'd really like those to be automatically color coded with background coloring. Last year at this conference, uh, a guy called Kyle Peters um, presented from Cobham Aerospace. And Cobham, he's a contracts guy, right? And he's got, he generates, he's, he's got a fire clause extractor, he's got his kind of core flow down grouped and you know, here's my flow downs, here's my critical ones that we must address, here's the ones that we're already compliant with, so don't worry about those. So he's got a dictionary. And he generates out a racy matrix with this dictionary. Now, for anybody who is thinking, God, that sounds interesting, we have Kyle speaking on a webinar that we recorded. So please go to our website. Underneath the webinar area, you will see his, 
is uh, this whole thing explained. And it takes about 30 or 40 minutes to actually explain what he's doing, but it's pretty neat stuff. Now, what Kyle would have loved to do is to automate the colorization of the flow down clauses just by clicking a button, right? And what Excel customization now allows us to go towards is exactly that, where you can start to use this capability to say, yeah, great, that report is lovely, but now I want to do some further tweaks on it. So that's what I'm saying here. Further manipulation on the default outputs. It has been a constant request for customers. We always got this. And we were kind of thinking, geez, do we need to build a kind of a UI that will allow you kind of change the order of the columns and, I don't know, do some funky stuff? And we came to the conclusion that it was going to be a nightmare to do that because everybody wanted something different. You know, if, if you think about all of your respective organizations, I guarantee you, every one of you has different versions of what you deem to be a good compliance matrix. I would imagine. It'd be very interesting to actually look at that at some point in time and see the changes and the differences. Some people have multiple sheets. Some people have multiple, you know, I, I saw a compliance matrix from one top five defense contractor once which had over 150 columns in it, which is an incredible thing. So different people have different views of what a compliance matrix is. So if you want to massage that output, this is what's going to do it for you. Importing into third-party systems. A lot of our customers are actually now taking the outputs of visible thread, the shreds, because of fundamentally, if you think about it, they're requirements, right? Particularly engineering companies, architectural and engineering companies, uh, aerospace, I suspect it's relevant. Anybody ever heard of a solution called Doors, IBM Doors? Hands up, a few hands there, great. Okay. What Doors is, it's a very archaic, very old, it must be at least 25 years old, about 20. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I hope there's no IBM Doors people in the audience. Uh, I don't mean to stand Doors. I, I did a startup before Visible Thread, and, and those days, and we're 10 years on the go of Visible Thread, but that was a requirements management station. We used to compete against Doors. And it was really clunky stuff. But it's in use very heavily by engineering companies to re track requirements, particularly for program delivery. So a lot of our customers, particularly in that engineering space, they want to take the shred, and they don't want to just manage it in Excel. They want to go one step further and push it in as individual requirements into the control solution, which is something like a requirements management system like Doors. And that's what this thing would allow us to do. Because they will have specific requirements on how you actually, you know, maybe you want a, a prioritization column beside every requirement. Maybe you want a, a um, an attribute or a new column that says who's going to do this. So putting those extra columns in play, and maybe you don't want that format where basically it's, it's all the content is in one column, and then the first three columns need to be eliminated, and then you can import it into a third-party solution. That's what we're going to get with this Excel customization. My god, it's 5-2. Sorry, guys. Um, we're supposed to have lunch at 12. I may run over slightly, but I hope. Are people tracking? It's OK? OK, good. So I'm going to crank on here. So macros are very interesting. So there's coding involved here. But can I ask a question? If you think about your own environment, how many of you have access to resources that might understand how to code macros? There's a few. OK. You're, you're it? All right. Excellent. You're going to be a busy boy. So we certainly will, as a company, support you if you have particular needs. But if you have access to anybody who's halfway decent at macros, and sometimes that may even be a contract resource, it could be worth getting those people in to do some of the work that you want to do. We'll happily handhold you, but we'll charge you for the privilege, of course. But really, you can self-serve on this stuff quite to, to a huge extent. So the idea here is that we're going to generate, rather than XLS files, which are standard Excel files, we'll generate XLS M files. M stands for macro. Okay? And the step one is that we're going to customize and set somewhere in the solution the file. Step two is we're going to export. And step three is that we're going to run a macro once I've got the export done. The beauty about this whole approach is that it's relatively light. It was lighter engineering-wise for us to do this and completely flexible to support all your needs because macros in Excel, it's a coding language. So you can do whatever the heck you want in Excel. That's the beauty of it. So here's the deal. 
We have a new option here in the options area. It's called Excel Output Customization. I apologize for this view. It's an awful view. Loads of text. But actually, the text is important for anyone who seriously is involved in this. We almost wanted to put a kind of a cheat sheet help file in here. So what it's saying is to customize click download workbook. So we're going to ship a macro enabled workbook that's a kind of a, a starter point for you. And I'm going to show you that workbook in action. I'll show you what it'll do in a moment. <coughs> when you download the workbook, if you're familiar with macros, you'll be able to go into the macro -E area on that, which is kind of in de developer tools. You'll be able to build your own macros. And then you'll upload that back in here. And lo and behold, by magic, it will appear when you go on the path of generating your export. So it's quite, quite powerful. And then when you come to do your export, you're going to see this nice, neat little new checkbox down here, very innocuous, called macros. And you're going to check that. And if you check that, the macro-enabled workbook that you've now gone and customized will automatically be the baseline for the export. What does that mean? You'll get a button on the top right that says, run certain things once you generate the output. So really important stuff. And that's the file you'll generate. It'll be an XLSM for macro. There may be security implications on this because in a particularly locked down environment, some of your IT colleagues get a little overzealous and prevent macro enabled docs or Excel spreadsheets to be downloaded. So what you need to do is you need to talk to your IT guys and explain to them this is what's happening and get the derogation that will allow you to do that. Um, is there any concern from your standpoint? Do you see concern on this? OK. Because we were curious about this. Yep. Does this allow for like, adding buttons and things like that to certain screens? Or does it just allow the code to run in the background and then someone needs to make keystrokes? <coughs> it's a great, great question. Um, and I'm going to say yes-ish with an asterisk. <laughs> read the footnote or read the, the fine print. I don't know because I don't know what's in your mind as to what you want to get towards. But I, whatever you can do in Excel is achievable by macros. And I'll show you how it works in a moment. So, so say you uh, code a macro and you tie it to a button. Yep. And you put that button in there and it uploads into Visual Thread. Will yep. that button appear if you tie to the macro and you download? No. So I think this is getting into advanced stuff. And certainly what yeah. we should probably do is, is have sideline conversations on that. Let, let me show you what it actually does do, and then it'll form a good frame of reference. You'll get a mental image of what, what this is going to do. So this is what's going to happen. I'll demo this live in a moment. In fact, let me cut to the chase. I'll just demo it live now. The, the slides will be there for you. Um, OK. Now, I am demoing a pre-release drop. That means it could blow up, OK? So forgive me. So I'm going to go to a different environment. This is my production environment. So I'm going to go to, and as I say, VT Docs. It's in final QA cycles right now. We're doing some fine tuning on this thing. I'm proud to say the person who wrote a lot of this stuff is actually an intern who just joined us this year, a really, really bright guy um, for Trinity College Dublin. So full marks for that computer science program. It's really good. OK, uh, here we go. So first things first, settings. Here's our new option. There's that little bit kind of dense thing. Nothing really to see here, so we'll move on. But just basically to say it's real. These buttons are there. Um, you can always get back to the old default one by clicking this. I know it's really hard to see, but uh, it says, need to get back to the original default? Just click here. Okay. So if you've mucked up the, the version of your workbook and you've put it up there and all of a sudden nothing's working, you can always get it back to the original. OK. Now let's go see how it works in action. I'm going to find a statement of work. I'm going to do a shred. I go to quality analysis, do the shred. Again, for those who've never seen Visible Thread before, we're using a dictionary here. We're shredding on the basis of finding all the keywords with will, shall, must. That's what's going on down here. There's my will, shall, must stuff. And I'm going to create a compliance matrix with one click. And by the way, for those who are not using multiple doc shreds, I think Lisa mentioned this in, in her speech or in her talk. We introduced this last year, but just in case you didn't catch it, you can shred multiple docs into one consolidated workbook as well. 
It's very, very important because you might have a sow, you might have PWS or whatever it might be. You could have a tech volume. You might want to shred all of those and put each one on a tab in the output. So that's what shred multiple docs does, but that's deviating a little bit. So here's my nice new checkbox. Very simple down here. I'm going to check it on. I'm going to accept all the settings because there's various things. You can split by paragraph, by text, or blah, 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 blah. Generate the matrix, not the film, the compliance matrix. And that we get, lo and behold, my workbook here. I'll open it up. That's from the prior generation, so it's opening as we speak. OK, first thing to note that's a little bit new. There's a little orange message up here. I'll read it for you. It says, this file contains macros. Hit enable content above to use them. That doesn't say enable content. It says enable editing. It's not a bug, don't worry. Once I hit enable editing, there's the enable content button, right? So there's kind of two steps. When you generate macros, or gener not so much generate, when you download from anywhere on the internet a macro-enabled workbook, this is how Excel works. It always, always, always does that. So you must hit enable, ed enable editing on the top, and then enable content. When I hit enable content, you'll notice that the message disappears, and we have this new button here. It says visible thread macros. So it's one new button. And now, if I click that, and I select one of the standard macros in here, I realize this is very, very tiny. So at the back, you're probably having difficulty reading it. The first macro that is defaulting in my system is called extract contents uh, in parentheses. And the second one is search content for dates. So. I think I might search content for dates. And what that basically is going to do is going to rip through column F, the content column. It's going to find what it thinks are dates based on the code in the macro. And it's going to put them into a new column on the right-hand side. OK, so let's just try that. <coughs> it's done. I close. Now I'm going to just resize, and I'll show you what it's done. February 27, 2011. It's put some green coloring here, and it's added a new column automatically with the actual extracted date. Dates, measures, whatever. <laughs> the world's your oyster, basically, in macro land, because as long as you can code these things, you can do whatever the heck you want. So if you see, I could even do a very quick and dandy acronym pull if you didn't feel like using our standard acronym extraction capability. Whatever, right? I don't see a whole lot of dates here in this example. Let me just try and run it against a more beefy doc that would be rather a little bit more interesting. The RFP itself, let's see if that's got something useful. Yeah. Yeah, so now this is in, the, in your hands. Basically, if you've got macros already, they will show up in the developer area of Excel. It's going to do no magic. You're going to take those macros. You're going to put them into the baseline uh, spreadsheet that we ship. And you're going to add those in. They'll show up in that list. See the list that, that I, I showed a moment ago? They're going to automatically show there. It will be for everyone that has this. We, use, we have our own version. How many macros do you have, Gene, roughly? Uh, About 12. OK. So all 12. If you add all 12 into the baseline one that we set into the tool, So it'll save you a, a lot of time. So I, I think, is the penny dropping for those of you who are VT users? Can you begin to see the applicability of this? So I was asked by the guys in Dublin, so I'm going to ask this question to you, because they're very keen to understand the actual real usage scenarios that you can think of. So can I throw it over to you? Can you think about examples? Where would you use this? Or, or maybe even, Gene, if you, would, you, would you be comfortable sharing some of those macros that you currently have and what they do? Let me, let me just get you a, um, a mic. And then we'll go off and steal the ideas and weave them into the product. I have macros to reformat the acronym, acronym list, to reformat um, the shreds, the compares, uh, dictionaries, um, 
Some of the other things that we do, such as requirements. Okay. Um, just about anything that they do. I do I do a macro basically to show readability on the on the item itself. When you do a compare, I'm, I'm sorry, let back it up a minute. When you do a, a, a shred, some of the words come out in gray, and right. people have problems with that. Okay. Well, I don't worry about it. It's much easy just to change it all at one time to black. I don't like the yellow on there. <laughs> that just shows the changes. Right. So I get rid of that, but then I make it into more of the, maybe the old time printouts where you have right. alternating colors and lines makes it easier okay. to read across so all those things that I do and when I end up getting the acronym list to someone it's in a form that they can automatically put into their gotcha. their RFP their okay. response so I have macros for just about anything okay so you're tweaking mostly cosmetic visuals to make it more accessible for your audience Is that right okay. and especially for um, the shred, right. we have a lot of other things that we want to put in. Sure. And so, and some a, a, of the additional columns. Additional columns, control type columns? Right. Yeah, okay. And then and other ones we don't use at all. Okay. So um, I have a way of doing that, but I have macros for everything. Okay. They're very handy and they're very, once you, once you do the macro, yep. um, and the good thing about it is you don't have to know Visible Basic to make them. Right. You just actually, start run your macro and you actually go through the steps and then stop the macro and your macro is done okay so but they're easy but yeah i'll be willing to give what i've got i've, I've got no problem with it great so it's and that's really great to hear because what we'd love to see and foster is you know we, we already have the dictionary marketplace out on the website we'd love to have people share freely these macros because there's not i mean we don't care. We want to kind of put out stuff that's of genuine use for the customer base. So really appreciate that. That's brilliant. Anybody else have any ideas on what macros could do for them? Let me just get you the mic. Anybody really hungry? Nah. <laughs> Covered. There you go. Well, I'm not sure if. Um if, if it would work for me because I'm not a, not really an Excel type person, uh, so I kind of macros like, ooh, is that the virus or something? You know, that sort of stuff, you know, like, <laughs> anyway. But, but what I do with the shred is that um, I use it in my reviews because um, what I do is that I take, I, I take away some of the non, you know, like, uh, non-requirement stuff from right. well, section one to whatever to until I hit number three or number two, and these are the technical stuff. And I see the shreds there, and these are the ones that I know. Okay, comply. I gotta hit comply with these things. Now, what I do is I create what I call my pink or red review sheet, and that review sheet essentially are the requirements on on the on the on the left hand side, sure. and then I put a new column that says did we comply? And then I give the sheet to the reviewers and I tell them, I want you to fill this in. Right. If we did not comply, I want you to say no or yes, whatever. Because then when they give it back to me, I then compile it all back. And then I see, well, for requirement number one, uh, rev three of my reviewers said no, 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 and only one. So now I can go back to the writer and say, hey, three out of four said you didn't hit it. So hit it again. So it's kind of, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, an objective way for me to okay. tell the reviewer, three didn't get it, guys, so you didn't okay. pass. You're not even compliant. So it's a, it takes the honest away from me, and I'm telling them, right. here, here's what the reviewer said, as opposed to notes everywhere here and there. Sure. It's, that's how I do it. So okay. would the macro be, help, would be helpful there? Yeah, absolutely. In a very simple way, that did we comply column. Um, if it were me, now maybe I'm over uh, enthusiastic about this stuff, but I would introduce, using a macro, I would say, right, I want the option to add this new column called did we comply? I want it to have two values, yes, no. When they click yes, it highlights the row in green. When they click no, it highlights it in red. So you're getting this highly visual feedback. Now a macro, and actually coding that up is not difficult. 
for somebody who knows how to do macros, which again is back to, yeah, we can certainly help, but look, if you can get it done by somebody, an intern or somebody else uh, in your organization, that's always a, a good approach. But we'll certainly help, and you can talk to us about that. Um, Denai, who's sitting to your right, <laughs> is, is the key point of contact for this. If it's something that's, you know, macros can be or, as long or as short as a piece of string. Um, and, and the approach, to Gene's point, you don't have to know Visual Basic for Applications, which is the coding language behind these things. You can record a macro yourself. But again, you probably don't have time maybe to do this stuff or inclination. And if you don't, maybe try and get some IT support. And then, of course, you're welcome to talk to us. If we can help, we will. Thanks. Any other usage of macros before we break for the lunch session? Can I, can I just understand, um, I'm pretty psyched about this whole macro stuff. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> okay. Go macros, excellent. Um, okay, cool. Listen, thanks so much for your attention. 